<laughs> then you get into the city and it becomes obvious what the real industry of Roswell is, yeah. which is the cover. <laughs> yeah, well, and every the aliens. Every street light in Roswell has alien eyes on it. Oh yeah, I know. The Central Cafe right downtown is called the Cover Up Cafe, and the menu is all, I mean, it's hysterical. It is. That whole town's making money off of um, And making fun of it. Too. Oh, I make fun of it at the same time. Yeah. Actually, there's a, a really good Polish-German restaurant there. So. <laughs> oh, the sauerkraut to die. Uh, I, I believe it's 10 o'clock. Yeah, anybody dispute that? Nope. All right. Nope. Uh, so let's what, get started. The name of this panel is... Points East. Points East. Um, I don't know who comes up with these clever titles. Uh, I do. Uh, In fact, it was me. Was it your time? <laughs> I was going to blame it on Dragon Con, but since you took it. <laughs> they told me I had to name the panel, so I named the panel. What we're going to discuss in this panel, and it's a little bit tricky because we've got tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock a panel called Snarky the Plots, which is where we'll get into what's going to be happening. In the where we lock the door. <laughs> After we lock the door, everybody's sworn to silence. And, you know, and you leave with a little collar. And the collars are put around your neck or you know, blow up if you spill it. Anyway, um, so we'll have to be a little bit careful today, not to overlap too much in that. But what this is about is so far the 6832 series has done very little in, well, I was going to say the Far East, but actually... The Near East. East. Well, by the way, just so everybody knows, if you ever wondered, the term Near East and Middle East today are used as basically synonyms. It used to be coherent and logical. Near East referred to what we think of as the Arab world, Levant. Middle East referred to India and Pakistan, which makes sense, it's in the middle. The Far East, I don't know when the shift happened, but it became the Middle East began, you know, I don't know when that happened. But so far in the series, we haven't basically had hardly anything to say about India, Pakistan, China, Japan, you know, anything out there, which is to say, even in those days, the majority of the world's population. Uh, we've been able to get away with it so far because it's plausible. Ring of Fire happens in May of 1631. Uh, Saxon Uprising, the latest book in the series, ends in May of 1636, well, actually March of 1636, so a little bit less than five years has passed. So it's plausible that it would take that much time for things to really start spreading. As it turns out, actually things happen happening. They, you didn't know about, but they have. Um, <laughs> just as things have been happening in Russia that you didn't know about. But Will, when Kremlin Games comes out here, um, what has been written so far is Ivor Cooper here has a book that is coming out. We don't know when, but soon. But when I say it's coming out, contracts have been signed, money has been paid. You know, this is not speculation. It's, and he's finished the mansion. I just read the last story last night. Works fine. Um, so we will be turning that manuscript into Bane very soon. Now, I don't know when they'll schedule it, but that um, story, mostly, it all takes place in the New World. But half of it involves what the Japanese are doing which I will let Ivor describe later. But, so we are finally going to be bringing Japan into the series in a really pretty big way. And then we will discuss this no further, but Ivor and I had a conversation yesterday. Yeah, and Ivor came up with a really nifty idea, so I think that we've got to talk some more about it, but I think we might do a novel together that would bring China into the series. Uh, we'll not talk about that. What that leaves, and then the Ottoman Empire. Are we putting the Ottoman Empire in point Yes. Yes, okay. The Ottoman Empire is about to figure in this series in a really, really major way. Um, it already appeared in Saxon Uprising. How many people here have read Saxon Uprising? Right. Cool. Just about yeah, everybody. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, you know, there was at least one chapter 
where you actually see the Ottomans on stage, and there was a number of references to them. Uh, the Ottomans, as was probably obvious from the Saxon uprising, it looks like they're getting ready to attack Austria, and sure enough, they will. And once they attack Austria, that will change the entire equation of everything that's happening in Syria in all kinds of different ways. Um, political alliances, dramatically the reason I wanted to do it was because about two, three years ago, I woke up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat and, and realized that, that the 6032 series we were in danger of peace breaking out all over. I can't have that. Because there was really no longer any plausible, really major Resist. opponent left in Europe with the French being out there and the Austrian. You know, so we needed, you can't have that for this kind of series. Um, you need, you know, it's not military SF and it's not really war stories, but it's stories that, that require that kind of background. Background, you know, for a story. I mean, lots of different kinds of stories get told in that. David and I are doing a novel that's a murder mystery in Magdeburg. It takes place basically around the same time as Saxon <laughs> Uprising. It's not a war story, but, you know, these are all stories told in times of war. It's like telling a whole series of stories set in the Napoleonic <laughs> era or set in the World War II, whatever. You, you, you need that framework. So bringing the Ottomans in does that. What it does mainly is it will wind up tying up most of the military power of the USA, which means they can't just use that military power anywhere they want to, which means there's lots and lots of room for adventures everywhere else. That's why we can have, as we will, a, a novel where, where Lieutenant Eddie Cantrell, missing his foot in with his new Danish wife, heads off to the West Indies and winds up discovering that Admiral Simpson's not going to come back him up because Admiral Simpson has to go to the Mediterranean and deal with the Ottomans. And so that means you can have at least one novel with Eddie Cantrell and Anna Catherine having all kinds of wonderful adventures. You, you, that's, you, you know, Honestly, I've said this before, writing novels is a lot more, more like making sausage than people <laughs> want, want to look at. It. And a lot of decisions authors make are, are based on these kinds of uh, really <laughs> slimy calculations of what you got to do to keep that people. Well, we Lois don't have enough fat. Lois says that the way she plots her novels is she says, what's the worst thing that I can do to this character? And then she writes it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty much what happens. Anyway, um, so the Ottomans are coming in in a big way. And then the one thing that's not, that's really up in the air, we haven't really thought much about it, <coughs> what to do with, this is the period of the heyday of the Mughal Empire in China. And we uh, touched on India. 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 Sorry, 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 India. Uh, there are some politics right there. It's interesting. Yeah, Shah Jahan is in power right now. He's the guy who built the Taj Mahal. In fact, I think the Taj Mahal is already under construction. He started almost done. 1632. Is it almost done? done? Is it almost done? Um, and we are not too far away from having that monster Aurangzeb, the Muslim fanatic, replacing him. It was 1658. Oh, was it that late? I thought it was sooner than that. Well, whatever happens, we, <coughs> we can. Uh, we right now he's 15. Right now he's a, a viceroy working uh, at subduing one of the sultanates okay, that right. are just below the empire. So we can kill him, right? Oh yeah, yeah. He, yeah, yeah we can kill him. <laughs> World history would be. You a see, much it sounds sociopathic, but that's the way you think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now. Um, the world would have been a better place without them, no doubt about it. Anyway, we haven't done much with, with the Mughals and haven't really thought much. We haven't done hardly anything with this. Uh, Persia in this day was under the Safavid. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. But the uh, Safavid. Huh? Safavid. Safavid. Safavid dynasty, and we've done squat with them, except they are... They're mentioned. Uh, well, well, they well, figure in terms of fighting then. the Ottomans, yeah. but in terms of what exactly might do with them. Anyway, so the point is, the series is just finally getting a point where we're going to start bringing in the Near East, East, the Middle East, and the Far East, actually, all in a big way. Um, 
And I'm going to stop talking because I can drink a little more coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Ivor, right, well, why don't you describe briefly what you're doing? Okay, well, what you have that's happened in Japan is they have <coughs> just gotten over the Sengoku period, the war, uh, a period essentially of civil war. There were three leaders who successfully united Japan for a time, Nobunaga, Hideyoshi, and Ayasu, and Ayasu established the system that stuck. The, 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 the Tokugawa rule. His grandson is the shogun right now, and there is a completion of the consolidation of power going on there. Um, the Christians made contact with Japan early in the 16th century, and they had useful things like firearms, Firearms that worked on a practical basis. The Japanese were certainly aware of the Chinese usages of gunpowder earlier. And the Japanese very, very quickly started copying the Portuguese archivists and using them. And in general, were very heavily involved with the Europeans in trade. Uh, uh, for one thing, the Japanese, um, well, I won't get into that. But in any event, the relation, uh, Christianity reached a point where at one point there were 300,000 Japanese that were Christian. The trouble is the Spanish and Portuguese were also babbling in politics. And this brought down <coughs> the wrath of the, the shogunate upon them when it consolidated power. All right. there was, there's persecution of, the, of Christianity, missionaries expelled, and then a more general crackdown. Things culminated in our timeline in the Shimabara Rebellion of 1637-38, which started as a pretty generic peasant rebellion um, based on famine and general crackdown, and became a more religious thing. The over 100,000 troops were assembled to crush that rebellion, and shortly thereafter, the Portuguese were banned entirely, and a little bit later, the Dutch were relocated to have their uh, trading base on the this little artificial island, Najima, in the uh, mouth of that in Nagasaki Harbor, and that pretty much was where things stayed in relative seclusion of Japan uh, from the West until. Uh, Perry changed things in the mid-19th century. So this is really was the cusp for the Japanese. And what I have happen is in 1633, knowledge of Granville and information about what 